At night we left Warsaw for Zeso, in southeastern Poland. Two days later we were there. Along the way we saw many trains with soldiers on the spare tracks and railway stations. We were ready for the fact that at any moment German planes could appear, and even when we spotted our own plane in the sky, we bristled with rifles and machine guns just in case. What the hell? We set up camp on the outskirts of Rezezo. We camouflaged the transmitters and hid the trucks and vans in a ravine. The people camped in tents and in nearby houses. The headquarters settled in the town and telephone lines were stretched from the camp. We stocked up on food. Everything was quiet for a few days, except for daily inspections, visits of the highest military commanders and the shaft of instructions that fell on us. On the last night of August 1939 going to bed, I ordered to wake me up at six in the morning. The ordinarian did not have to carry out my order. At about five o'clock on the morning of 1 September, through my sleep I heard the sound of explosions. I jumped out of the tent and ran into my sergeant. It started, Lieutenant. It started, he shouted. Nonsense. It's just a drill. If it is, the pilots have gone mad. They're firing live ammunition, he shouted, pointing into the sky. In the clear morning sky above Arzezo, we saw silvery aeroplanes. Their fuselages glistened in the sun, contrasting with the puffs of black smoke they left behind them. A crowd of people gathered around us, anxiously watching the aeroplanes. From the direction of the city came the sounds of heavy bursts. They're bombing the city, Lieutenant. The sergeant insisted, but I didn't want to believe it. There was no declaration of war. They couldn't just start a war. I persisted. And even as a column of smoke rose over the city centre and air raid sirens wailed, my brain refused to believe what was happening. The phone rang. Headquarters was on the line. We are being bombed by German planes. The Germans are advancing all along the border, without a declaration of war. There are fires in the city, there are wounded and killed. This is war. Having finished talking, I left the tent and met the senior sergeant's questioning gaze. There's a war on, sergeant. Line up the men. A few minutes later, the troops were lined up outside my tent, and I was about to announce the outbreak of war to them. But it was no longer necessary. A twin-engine aeroplane with a clearly distinguishable swastika was flying over our heads, pouring lead all around. We threw ourselves to the ground. When later people asked me how I got around in southern Poland in the early autumn of 1939, I said that it all depended on the length of the jump. Yes, yes. I did not misspoke. It all depended on how far I was from the ground, just standing or jumping out of a rushing lorry to lie on the ground and then crawl into cover while the enemy aircraft dropped bombs or hurricane fire. Zizo experienced two more German air raids that morning, and then all was quiet for the rest of the day. We learnt from radio reports that there was fierce fighting all along the Polish-German border. There were frequent reports of raids on Polish villages and towns. We assumed that this would happen, but we did not know when and we were practically unprepared for defence. Our armament compared to the German armament could not withstand any criticism. What could we do against the enemy's air power dominating the skies over Poland? Only a few dozen fighting. My transmitters were red hot from hard work. The special purpose platoons kept in touch with the army group, transmitting and receiving information, locating and targeting aircraft with radar. Another group was engaged in radio interception. Caught German messages were forwarded to headquarters, the Radio Intelligence Service. The war began, but despite the bombing and shelling, we still could not believe it. The realisation of what had happened came the next morning. At dawn, the Germans again raided Razazo, and thousands of refugees moved eastwards along the road a few hundred metres from our location. German bombers dropped their bombs into the thick of people who crowded the road and machine-gunned the survivors. Shocked by what was happening, feeling completely helpless, we watched the road with horror from the ravine where our camouflage transmitters were located. Someone tried to shoot with a rifle at the planes with swastikas. Someone threatened them with fists. When the planes flew away, we ran out onto the road to render aid. There were only a few people left alive. Hardly able to get to their feet swaying, they suddenly rushed to run. Some looked around helplessly for loved ones. Moans and cries for help came from all sides. The road was strewn with corpses. Some had turned into a shapeless mass. A horrible mixture of torn flesh, human and horse, belongings, food, broken carts and blood-soaked earth littered the road. 
The picture of mass murder shook me to the core. I felt my legs shaking and was forced to sit down on the edge of the ravine. I was shaking like a fever. When I recovered a little, I stood up with difficulty and realized that I had to... When I saw a hand sticking out of a pile of earth turned up by the bomb, I bent down, gathered my strength, and pulling fell on my back. There was no body. I stretched out one arm. The ordeal was beyond me. I had never felt so bad. That morning, the Germans bombed Arzezzo two more times. People were fleeing the town in panic, but the traffic on the road slowed down. After the first raid, carts and cars could hardly move along the road, which was disfigured by shell craters and littered with corpses. The last raid completed the picture of mass murder of civilians. Night had fallen. Everything was quiet, but I couldn't sleep, replaying in my mind the terrible images of the past day. The thousands of refugees moving eastwards, the hundreds of bodies buried in a mass grave by the roadside, brought back memories of my childhood. Our wanderings, my mother clutching my hand whenever we heard the sound of gunfire, my memory brought me back to those years. As soon as I closed my eyes, the picture of my early childhood appeared before my mind's eye. All, all of us, Antic, Lida and I, confused, hungry, in constant search of food, warmth and shelter, huddled around our mother. What's wrong with Mum? How is she now? Gazelovka is east of Krakow, which means that now she is on the front line of the front. Was Mother among the thousands of refugees on the road at the time of the German bombing? Or perhaps she was among those who walked past our camp that night? Unaware that her baby was a few hundred metres from the road, or perhaps her body, mutilated beyond recognition, was buried by my men in a mass grave. The night provided a respite from the bombardment, but sleep would not come. Lying with my eyes open, I kept repeating to myself, This is war, this is war. People are being killed. I too may be killed and buried in a mass grave. Will I be killed, or will it be avoided? Do the Germans care whether I live or die? How many people will die before the war is over? Will we all die? I don't want to die. I want to live. I remembered my mother's face, flushed with pain and anger as she looked at our home destroyed by the enemy, her fists clenched in pain, and the words of her vow to speech. I will teach my children to hate you. I will teach them to live and... I wonder, I thought, if I can shoot down a German aeroplane with a revolver. There are no Germans in the neighbourhood. The front is in Krakow. It was still dark when I was called to headquarters in Rezozo. While I was at headquarters, the air alarm sounded, but there was no bombing. I got the ciphers and went back to camp. As I walked back past the post, I noticed that there was no sentry to guard the camp and keep civilians out. When I looked round, I saw that he was lying on the ground with a rifle lying nearby. Mr. Kaufmachens, silence. Hmm, sentry? No reaction. I got out of the car and approached the soldier lying on the ground. As soon as I bent over, a shot rang out and a fountain of earth flew up beside me. What the hell is that? I turned the sentry over and saw bloody foam on his lips. I don't understand a thing. What's wrong with him? What's even going on? Just then a shot rang out again, foaming the ground beneath my feet. What kind of idiot shoots a gun? I shouted, not sure who I was talking to. Shots rang out in reply, followed by a volley of automatic rifles, accompanied by a shout. Get down, Lieutenant. Get down or you'll be killed, shouted one of my sergeants. The voice came from the ravine where our vehicles were hidden. Not understanding anything, however, I obeyed the sergeant, fell to the ground and crawled towards the ravine. What's going on, sergeant? Um, German parachutists, lieutenant. Judging by the shots, there are about a dozen of them. While you were at headquarters, they were dropped from an aeroplane. How many of our men were killed? Hmm. Eight men, lieutenant. All those who were on duty at the transmitter. They were taken by surprise. Where are the Germans now? I don't know, Mr. Lieutenant. They must be in the apple orchard. Do you hear machine gun fire from there? They're shooting at the farm too. And two over there. He waved his hand in the direction. But they did. We killed them when they ran away. And where's all ours? Miss some in the houses, Mr. Lieutenant, some in the ravine, in tents and under lorries. The Germans start shooting as soon as they move. Frightened by the shots, a calf ran past us, and immediately a machine gun burst. The Germans had us in a ring, 
They fired from the farm, from a haystack standing in the field, and from nearby houses. God of our trucks burst into flames and exploded. The bullets hit the petrol tank. The fire spread to two neighboring trucks. Judging by the shots, some of the Germans lay down in a ravine. They will take us out one by one if we don't think of something urgently, said the sergeant. Right. Crawl down the ravine and tell everyone to be ready to rush to the houses in a quarter of an hour. The smoke from the burning lorries will give us cover. We'll clear them out of the houses first, then we'll do the rest. The sergeant crawled to the bottom of the ravine. I crawled too, but in the other direction. I'd only a pistol, but it was of little use now, so I decided to get the rifle of the dead sentry. I managed to get the rifle and returned even before the appointed time. In spite of the bright, sunny day, I did not see a single German. They were well camouflaged, and only their shots gave me an idea where they might be hiding. From the other end of the ravine I heard three revolver shots. This was the signal that everyone was ready. I answered with three shots, jumped out on the embankment, and ran across the open space toward the houses. Shots rang out. Someone shrieked and I saw my men running towards the houses. Gasping, I jumped over the fence into the backyard and rolled under the wall of the house. Two bullets whistled and embedded themselves in the wall just above my head. I jumped up, ran around the corner of the house, kicked in the door with my foot, and slid inside. No one. I rushed to the stairs and had managed to get up one flight when I felt some movement behind me. A blow to my head knocked me off balance and I fell down the stairs. The room swam before my eyes, the world went dark, and I lost consciousness. I came to my senses. I was surrounded by faces, but I was looking at them as if through a column of water. Their images were blurred and multiplied. They moved their lips, but the sound of their voices did not reach me. When consciousness returned to me fully, I saw several women leaning over me. Thank God you are alive, Lieutenant. I thought I had killed you, he said one of them. Why did you hit me? Mum thought you were German, explained the young girl, so she hit you as you were going up the stairs. Did it hurt a lot? You didn't regain consciousness for almost an hour, added another. Oops, how long? I shrieked. An hour. And what's going on outside? Mm. They must have killed all the Germans, because the shooting stopped and we saw our soldiers leading some captured Germans to your lorries, explained the girl who said I had been lying faint for nearly an hour. With a huge bump on my head, still not quite recovered, I wandered to my tent. No one was firing any more. The German parachutists were either killed or capped. We thought you had been killed, Lieutenant, said the sergeant. The soldiers were looking for you everywhere. I told the sergeant what had happened to me and asked about the prisoners. We captured four, Lieutenant. I don't know if they're still alive. The boys wanted to kill them. Bring them in. Yes, Lieutenant. When the German prisoners were brought to my tent, I saw that they were in perfect health and not even injured. How many parachutists were dropped? I asked the German nearest to me. While Hitler. Mm, from what aerodrome did you take off? I asked the second one. Real Hitler. He shouted in answer to my question and threw out his hand in the Nazi salute. Should we shoot the bastards and be done with it? Asked the sergeant. Now who might you feel after that? But they killed fourteen of our blokes and a few civilians. They, they certainly deserve to die, but HQ might try to get some information out of them. So take them under escort to Rizizo. I Suddenly one of the Germans shouted in Polish, with a barely audible foreign accent. They'll never make us talk. Never. You can shoot us, you damned Poles. We'll destroy you anyway. The we are marked will finish you off. There won't be a single Pole left on earth. We... He didn't manage to finish the sentence. The sergeant's heavy fist knocked the German to the ground. Bring them to headquarters immediately, alive. I shouted. I couldn't vouch for myself now. Why, one of the sergeants was busy loading the prisoners and guards into a lorry to go to the headquarters in Rosezzo. The other reported that all the houses and the farm had been inspected. There were no Germans anywhere. Our losses totaled 14 men. The Germans lost eight and four were taken prisoner. How did they know about our location, Lieutenant? Spies? Asked the sergeant. I think they detected our transmitters, sergeant. By the way, the transmitters were not damaged. One was riddled with bullets. It's completely out of commission. What about our dead soldiers? Lieutenant, we'll bury them, sergeant. Do it as soon as possible, because we may have to dismount soon. 
yes, Lieutenant. I went to look at my dead soldiers. They were lying on the ground in a row, arms at the seams, as if at attention. Two of them had been mortally wounded in the head. Blood was no longer flowing from their wounds. The others had received fatal bullets in various parts of their bodies, and only the red stains on their uniforms indicated where they had been hit. In the distance, watching the soldiers digging a grave, stood weeping women and children. I stepped back and sat down on a log behind the barn to gather my thoughts. From here I could see the gradually growing heap of earth that the soldiers digging the grave were throwing on the surface. The soldiers themselves were no longer visible, and a few women were washing the faces of the dead. They had brought water in buckets from the farm. I was thinking over what had happened, figuring out what I should say at the funeral, when suddenly from somewhere behind my head machine gun fire rang out and several women fell into the grave. The others rushed to escape. I instantly realized that there was a German left in the barn who had probably burrowed deeply into the hay as my men scoured the neighborhood. He was now taking a cursory fire through a gap in the barn just above my head. I had already looked round the barn and knew that there were two doors in it. One quite large, into which a cart could drive, and a smaller one round the corner, just opposite where the shooter had positioned himself. Almost squeezing myself into the wall, I crawled to the small door, lying on the ground, opened it, and crawled into the shed. I was lying on the earthen floor, and behind a low partition on bales of hay stood a German shooting at the women running across the yard. I raised my revolver and aimed at his silhouette, but the wooden partition prevented me. I moved a little to the right and accidentally dropped the pitchfork. The German turned round, but I had time to get to the floor. He crawled off the bale, intent on finding the source of the noise, and I resolutely shot him right in the face. He fell to the floor with a clatter, and I kept firing until I had used all the bullets, though I knew I had killed him instantly, throwing the revolver which had become useless. Aside, I turned the German over on his back. I had hit him in the head, and now I watched the blood gushing from the wound. Then I noticed a blood-stained card sticking out of his pocket, and I bent down to pick it up. This saved me, for at the same time another German jumped on top of me, but he apparently did not expect me to bend down and missed. The revolver was empty, and without thinking long I seized a pitchfork and jabbed it into his stomach as he lunged at me. He yelped and collapsed to the floor. I pulled out the pitchfork and stabbed him with it until he gave no sign of life. Then I sank to the floor beside him, feeling dead tired. We buried our men with the women shot by the two Germans I had massacred. Then, having received orders to move in an easterly direction, we dismounted. Our column, lorries and vans with radio equipment and people drove along roads clogged with civilian traffic, cars, carts, prams, hum had children sitting in them. Some were laden with belongings and suitcases and thousands of refugees. Day after day, for almost three weeks, we retreated eastwards. The enemy gave us no rest, shelling from the air, dropping small groups of parachutists. In the prevailing chaos, we received conflicting orders, or no orders at all. On 17 September 1939, we entered Elvolf, where our southern armies were regrouping. I received orders to station my company on the High Castle, a freestanding hill from which the entire city was visible. It was here that my radio operators received the first report of our victory in the war, when more than a hundred German tanks and armoured vehicles were destroyed in the battle for the town and the Germans retreated to a safe distance. We were jubilant. There were rumours that a British plane with reinforcements had landed and that the British-French Expeditionary Army had entered the Baltic Sea. But our happiness did not last long. The Germans went on the attack, and although they failed to take the city, they entered the northern suburbs. Heavy fighting continued for several days, during which my men, who were not busy working on radio transmitters, repelled an attack by German infantry trying to take a dominant height. The Germans were unable to use tanks, and we managed to drive them back from High Castle. Suddenly the Germans retreated in a westerly direction, and there was an unaccustomed silence in the city. Now in the sky above the city began to appear new, unfamiliar to us planes. Their emblem was not a swastika, but a hammer and sickle. The Russians had made a deal with the Germans, agreeing to divide Poland between them, and were reconnoitering the area. At that time, of course, we did not have accurate information and used only rumours. We still wanted to think that England and France would not leave us in trouble. On the 26th of September, my radio operators caught a radio message. It was in bad Polish, with a strong accent. It's Polish peasants and workers. The victorious Soviet army, 
which has brought freedom to the Soviet land, is coming to liberate you from the capitalists and landlords under whose yoke you have been for many years. We are coming as liberators and friends. We are coming to give you freedom. We are your friends. We are your liberators. Proletarians of all countries unite. Soviet planes dropped millions of leaflets on the city, with the text transmitted by radio, flying riskily at roof level. What was happening left us completely confused. We had no communication with Warsaw and other army groups scattered around the country. The Germans had withdrawn from Elwolf on their own initiative. Militarily, Poland had been defeated. We learnt this from radio reports received from abroad. And now the Russians have come. Did they come as friends? We didn't believe it. We knew them too well. But why didn't they attack us? What's going on? Some people thought that the Russians had come to help us fight against the Germans, but I strongly disagreed with such a version. Why did they come anyway? At two o'clock in the morning, the telephone rang in my tent, and the officer on duty from headquarters gave me a short ord. The city surrenders to the Russians. All personnel, officers, and private seas are free to go home. Destroy all equipment. Destroy all equipment. I tried to get more information from him, but he only added, Murty time is short. Do it. The sergeant turned very pale when I read him the orders I had received. It's over, sergeant, it's over. We gathered the men and explained the situation. Everyone was stunned. But orders are orders. We distributed the remaining food and started destroying transmitters, lorries and vans in general, all available equipment. We were almost finished when the first Russian unit arrived on a lorry. With guns drawn, but with smiles on their faces, they ordered us to gather in one place. We had no choice but to obey. Where are your officers? asked the Russian commander. I stepped forward. Uom, who gave the order to destroy the equipment. In complete silence he came towards me and reached for my revolver. While two of his men stood on either side of me, I took the revolver out of its holster and handed it to him. You will have it later. Now follow me. Where to? Hey, to headquarters. Don't worry, he added with a broad smile. You'll soon be free to leave in peace. A mere formality. And what will happen to my men? I asked anxiously. They too will go to the headquarters, only later. He led me to the lorry. Everything happened so quickly that I only had time to wave goodbye. Goodbye, Lieutenant. They shouted after me. Good luck. Chapter 6 On our way to the city, and on the streets of Lovov, we met patrols who put Polish officers in our lorry. But instead of heading towards the centre of Lievi, we left the city on one of the roads leading in an easterly direction. Where are you taking us? We asked the Russian officer. You will soon find out. Hmm, he answered this time without a smile. Don't worry. But how could we not worry? A lorry was following us with a machine gun mounted on its roof. Soon we caught up with other lorries in which Polish officers were also travelling. I don't like all this, said the captain sitting next to me. I don't trust these Asians. However, my neighbour on my left was more optimistic. Hey, they'll probably agitate us and then let us go, he said. Let them agitate. I have no objection to that. I'm more afraid of their bullets, said another. We shall see. Perhaps they did come as friends. But we did not have to wait long for answers to our questions. After a few kilometres, we were forced to stop because one of the trucks had broken down. Our guards immediately jumped to the ground, guns drawn. Own? Anyone who tries to escape will be shot on the spot, announced the Soviet officer. Everything became clear. We were prisoners. The convoy stopped in Viniki, a village about 16 kilometres east of Livov. Eight men, myself among them, got off the lorry and, accompanied by guards, entered the cattle yard. We watched the pigs being driven out of the pigsty to make room for us. One of the Polish officers tried to protest, but a blow with a rifle butt silenced him. There was nothing to do. We crawled into the pigsty and tried to find a dry place, and then shots rang out. Good God! They'd already started shooting someone. It wasn't like that. They were shooting at pigs. Green to pigsty reeked of manure. We couldn't find a dry place to sit down, but we couldn't stand up to our full height either. The height of the pigsty didn't allow it. In the gap between the logs we watched the guards. The soldiers were cutting up the pigs and were in high spirits. An hour or so passed. We could squat no longer and sat on the floor in the manure. In a minute, not only our trousers, but our underwear was completely soaked. The first one who couldn't stand it was the captain. Hmm, 
Sentry, sentry, he shouted. One of the soldiers approached the Pixty. What do you want? Mer, call your commander. Call your commander at once, ordered the captain. The sentry laughed and stepped back. You bloody Bolshevik bastard, yelled the captain. The sentry turned round, pointed his rifle at the Pixty and roared. You son of a bitch, you damned capitalist. The captain was bursting into action, but we all piled on him, silencing him. It's hard for me to say what was more painful. The horrible stench that soaked every inch of our clothes, every cell of our skin, or the humiliation of the situation we were in. I think during the night, some of us even managed to take a nap. Some prayed, and there were those who swore horse nap. We could hear the guards changing during the night. Dawn peeked through the cracks of the barn and revealed eight exhausted, dirty, sleepless red eyes. We watched as the Soviet soldiers ate breakfast, cut in huge slices of bread, and inhaled the smell of coffee, which managed to overpower even the stench of the pigsty. Then a car appeared carrying a Soviet officer, trim, in a uniform that fit him splendidly. He entered the house, answering the greetings of those present. Now at least things will move forward, one of us remarked. The Soviet sergeant, accompanied by two soldiers, approached the pigsty and, removing the lock, opened the door. Each of you must state your name, rank, and the unit you serve in, he announced. I was closest to the door, and my name topped the list. When everyone had given the required information, the sergeant shouted my name and command. Get out. Come outside. Well, I was escorted under guard into the house. In the room, a Soviet officer, who had recently arrived by car, was sitting at a table with papers spread out. You stink. With these words, he greeted my appearance with an indifferent glance. He spoke good Polish. What the hell can I smell like if I spent the night in a pixty? I exploded. Perfume? But did I put you there? He asked, smiling politely. Then at least tell your people to put us in a normal room. Hey, it is not in my power, but I can convey your wishes to the head of the guard, he replied politely. They won't let us eat or drink. Oh, well, I'll tell him that too, the officer promised. It was only then that I realized he was just messing with me. And if I open the window, you smell so bad, I can't stand it. The officer grimaced and continued, turning to the gun. Give the lieutenant a chair. I sank down on the chair with a squelch the fault of my soaked trousers. Now let's get down to business. Who are you by profession? What did you do before the army? I was an officer of the Merchant Navy, mm, I answered. And before that? A civil servant. And before that? It's a student, a young man, a child and an infant. Are you satisfied? I shouted. Mm, quite satisfied, he replied, still smiling politely. But why should you be so angry? You know perfectly well that this is a mere formality. When will I be released? When the formalities are over. It won't take long, he said calmly. Accompanied by a convoy, I returned to the pigsty and another officer was taken in for questioning. I relayed to my fellow prisoners the whole conversation with the Soviet officer, and they flooded me with questions. Hmm. Does he speak Polish? Yes, with almost no accent, I replied. Jacinta did make any complaints? Of course, I told him everything. And what did he say? I already told you. He said we wouldn't be here long. After everyone was questioned, we tried to analyze the situation. How will further events unfold? We couldn't agree on that. There was a major among us who knew the Russians quite well. He had been a Russian prisoner of war in 1920. However, even he did not dare to give an accurate prediction. As far as I know, they either shoot us straight away or try to sway us to their side, he said. They didn't shoot us, and that's encouraging. Yes, I don't see why they should shoot us. We're not fighting against them, came a surprised voice. You'll never understand them. They can shoot you for being an officer, or a landowner, or a capitalist, or simply for being a Pole. They called us counter-revolutionaries in the last war, replied the Major. Silence reigned. I wonder how long we'll stay in this mud. Broke the silence with a disgruntled voice. We endured four days, and then our patience came to an end. When the Soviet commissar we now knew who the officer who had talked to us was, arrived in the morning to continue the interrogations, we revolved. He allowed us to clean out the pigsty and spread dry straw. What bliss it was. 
For six days, the interrogations continued. In the morning, the commissar would arrive by car. We would be taken to his room one by one under guard. We would answer questions about our past lives, and he would check them against the answers we had given at the previous interrogation. He behaved politely, and sometimes even offered us a smoke. We were fed daily and given hot coffee. But to all our demands for release, he invariably replied, after the formalities are over, it won't take long. On the sixth day, when I was brought in for questioning, the commissar behaved somewhat differently. Your case has been dealt with at headquarters. Read it, he said, tossing me some typewritten sheets. It was an indictment stating that I had acted contrary to the interests of the friendly Soviet army, had incited my subordinates to destroy military equipment, which should have been handed over safe and sound into the hands of Soviet military representatives. It further followed that I had acted as a reactionary by carrying out hostile actions against the Soviet Union. Do you plead guilty? He asked when I had finished reading the document. Of course not. As for the apparatus, I'll give you a day to think about it, he interrupted me. Otherwise we will take our own measures. The other Polish officers were given similar charges. We discussed the new circumstances, and for the first time the idea of escape was raised. However, the Major was strongly opposed to such an idea. They probably want to make us an offer and are trying to put pressure on us in this way, he suggested. What kind of offer? Uh, to work for them. They are probably already thinking of forming a Polish army, an army of Polish communists. If everything is as I think it is, I'll be the first to accept their offer, you said the Major. You, Mr. Major? One of us cried out in surprise. Well, yes, I am. I said the Major calmly. It will be much easier to escape from there than from here, where we are guarded day and night. No suggestion was made, however. The interrogations that followed on the seventh and eighth days followed a new pattern. When I was brought before the Commissar, he asked me sharp. You, do you plead guilty? No, I do not plead guilty. I answered just as sharply. Turning to the guards who had brought me in for questioning, he said, and tried to convince him and turned his back to me. One of the soldiers hit me in the chest with a rifle butt. When the blow knocked me backwards, the other soldier kicked me back to my feet. Then another blow and another kick. No. Do you plead guilty? The commissioner asked without turning his head. No, I don't. You bloody sons of bitches. You're more... I fell down and lost consciousness from the blow of the buttstock in my teeth. When I came to, the commissar, looking at my bloody face with disgust, ordered the guards to take me back to the pigsty. Hmm. I can't stand the sight of blood, he said after me, closing the barn door behind me. The soldier who had hit me in the face gave me a cigarette. Why are you so stupid, he said in a friendly tone. Why didn't you say you were guilty? I wouldn't have had to beat you then. We'll shoot you anyway, so why suffer? Shoot us, but why? I mumbled with bloody lips. Orders, you fool. It can't be helped. Orders must be obeyed, he replied, smiling. That day, after the interrogations, everyone returned to the pigsty beaten. On the ninth day, we were beaten so severely that some of us were brought back after interrogation. They could not walk themselves. That evening, when the commissar had left, a guard friendly to me pushed some cigarettes through a crack in the pigsty. We were amazed. He was one of those who had beaten us particularly severely during interrogations. Why such magnanimity? One of us asked a question. I want you to enjoy yourselves one last time. Tonight is your last night, the soldier replied. What do you mean? Are you saying we'll be released in the morning? The soldier laughed. Yes, yes. You'll be completely free. Free from excitement and interrogation. Free to return to your God, he quoted, and beating his chest, proudly added. You see, I know all about you reactionaries and your gods. Soviet soldiers are cultured people. Will you pray? All this, he said to us through a gap between the logs. There was silence in the pigsty. Come on, pray, he suddenly shouted. Pray, because tomorrow you'll be shot. He looked at us curiously through the crack, expecting to see a reaction to his words. We were silent. We were stunned. We were unable to move or speak. With a disappointed look, he walked away from the barn. For a while, we sat there without uttering a sound. Hey, I'm not going to wait to be slaughtered like a pig. I'm going to take my chances shouted the captain, breaking the silence. Shut up, you fool. Do you want them to hear you? Shouted at him. 
Do you think they're really going to shoot us, Mr. Major? I asked. I'm afraid so, he replied. I have no desire to pray. Do you? Then let's act. The captain joined the conversation, and urgently. We have too little time. Now come on, come on. Break through the logs with your head, advised a voice from the darkness. Maybe you'll make a hole in the wall for us and we can escape. That's right, shouted the captain. That's what we must do. By then it was getting dark. We gathered in a corner of the pigsty and began to discuss escape options. In this pitch darkness we could not see each other and could only distinguish those who spoke by their voices. We are voices in the dark, someone said quite accurately. Who can hear us? Oh, the bastards behind the wall. If we talk too loud, came the reply. We had already spent ten days in the pigsty, during which we had been interrogated every day, so we knew that we were guarded by one soldier with a rifle. At times there were two. They changed every six hours. The changed guards were in the house. Sometimes one of them would come out of the house to have a chat with the guard standing at the door of the pigsty. The pigsty was an extension of a large barn and was made of strong logs, including the floor. It was a kind of defence against the pigs, who had a bad habit of digging up the ground. The farm was not far from the road. Behind it was a field planted with cabbages, and further on a small forest. After a short meeting we concluded that we had two real possibilities of breaking free. We could either turn a log out of the floor, ram the door with it and rush out, or we could make a dig and, waiting for the guard to drop his guard, get out of the pigsty. We had already noticed that the guards often sat against the wall of the barn with their rifles on their knees, and sometimes on the ground beside them. We decided to make a dig. In this case, as we thought, there was a better chance of success. Having cleared the floor of straw, we found two relatively thin logs, between which there was a fairly large space into which we could stick our hand deep enough. The first attempt ended in failure, as we began to pull the logs out. A creaking sound from the friction of the logs alerted the guard who was walking along the pigsty. He stopped at the door and listened. Let someone sing. Come on, start, someone said quickly. Hmm, who can sing? Well, hurry up, said another. The best thing is to sing a hymn. It will drown out the noise, said the first one. Someone started singing, and gradually the others joined in. We sang the whole hymn to the and now the litany. Everybody sing. There was a new order. From the pigsty into the night flew the words of the litany, sung passionately and no doubt, sincerely by many of us. At the sound of the singing, several Soviet soldiers came out of the house. After standing for a while, they returned to the house. Oh, the reactionaries are praying. We heard a familiar voice. What fools. Finally, we managed to move the logs, and we started digging the ground with our bare hands. As we continued to sing, we quickly removed the top layer of earth, which was soaked not only with pig urine, but also with our own R. We had been living in the pigsty for ten days already, digging about half a metre deeper. Further down was a layer of stones probably put in by the builders as drainage. We pulled the stones out and sang. Then came the earth again, which began to collect in the undercroft. There were sounds of singing in the darkness, silent curses from the hole, and single splashes as clods of earth slipped out of our hands and fell into a puddle at the bottom of the hole. We fervently believed that these sounds were drowned out by our singing. We piled the excavated earth, stones and dung, in a corner of the pigsty, and in case an overly curious guard decided to shine a torch inside, we prepared straw to cover the pile and the entrance to the crawlway. We estimated that by about three o'clock in the morning we would be able to finish almost all the work. Five centimetre of compacted earth would be left to the surface. We planned to pull it out at the last moment, when the guard, tired of the continuous walking, would sit down to rest by the shed. In the meantime, we, tired, dirty, stinking of manure, sat waiting, never stopping singing for a moment. We were all tense to the utmost. The Major suggested we draw lots. In the darkness, seven hands reached for the straws clutched in his hand. Then we compared the outstretched straws by touch. The shortest one was mine. Lieutenant, you will be the first to go through the dig, the Major announced. The others, depending on the length of the straws. I suggest we keep singing. Once on the surface, do not run. Try to take cover in the woods. With any luck, we'll all escape. But what if they see us or hear us? I was saying run as fast as you can, he advised. May we be lucky. 
We lined up according to the lot, and then someone whispered, Hmm, quiet. Do you hear that? The guard stopped walking. We began to listen. Indeed, no footsteps were heard. In what place he stopped, it was absolutely unclear. The sky in the east began to lighten, but no matter how we peered through the slits of the pigsty, we could not see the soldier, nor could we tell if he was sitting in his usual place against the wall of the barn. Where the devil is he? whispered the Major. Maybe he's gone into the house, someone suggested. Or maybe he went round the corner to relieve himself. We waited about fifteen minutes, but we still had no idea where the guard was. It was getting lighter and lighter. I was shivering, but not from the cold. We can't wait any longer. Go, the Major whispered to me. I crawled into the piss-filled hole and began to scrape the remaining earth. From the pigsty I could hear the sounds of song. From time to time I heard my comrades cleaning up the earth I had thrown down. Not a sound came from outside. After about ten minutes I whispered downstairs. All done. The hole is quite sufficient. I'm good to go. Inch by inch I crawled through the hole, trying to make as little noise as possible. Behind me, I felt the rest of the men below dragging away the earth. It took another minute before I could squeeze my head in, followed by my arm, shoulders, and then my other arm. I wiped the dirt off my face, wiped my eyes, and looked around to see the guard sitting against the wall of the pigsty, a step away from me. He was asleep with his rifle and bayonet fixed in his lap. My first thought was to dive back into the manhole, but the man crawling behind me, seeing daylight, pushed my way up, using his shoulders as a stepping stone. I began to climb to the surface, keeping my eyes on the guard. The noise barely audible, nevertheless woke our guard. He looked around incomprehensively before realising that something strange was going on. That was enough time for me to get out of the crawlway and grab him by the throat. I squeezed my fingers around his neck with all the strength I could muster. With his eyes bulging, trying to reach out for me, he opened and closed his mouth wordlessly, unable to make a sound. I could feel his neck tense under my fingers. With his hands he tried to reach for my throat. He fell to the ground. He was lying on top of me, but he could barely move his arms. After twitching for a few moments, he suddenly fell silent. The man who appeared after me from the crawlway drew his rifle and thrust the bayonet into the guard's collapsed body. I jumped hastily to my feet. They must have heard the noise in the house, for the door opened sharply and soldiers rushed into the courtyard. Run, hurry, shouted the captain to me. We jumped over the low fence that separated the farm from the cabbage beds, the captain with his rifle in his hand. Shots rang out behind us. We ducked behind a pile of manure, and from there we saw two more of our comrades climb out of the manhole. One of the soldiers rushed towards them, firing a pistol. The captain took aim, fired, and put the soldier down. Two more prisoners climbed to the surface and ran in our direction. The captain managed to shoot two more soldiers who ran out into the courtyard at the noise. Almost all of us had already got out of the pigsty, when one of the fugitives suddenly slowly fell to the ground, hit by a machine gun burst. The other two ran to the road and disappeared from sight. Just then we heard the sound of a lorry moving along the road. The brakes squealed and the lorry stopped at the farm. We jumped up at the same time and rushed across the field towards the woods. Bullets whistled around us, ripping through the white cabbages. I ran as I had never run before. My throat was tight, my lungs seemed short of air. I was gasping for breath. To be honest, I was a bad runner, but my feet carried me along the ground through ditches and furrows, Closer and closer to the forest, gullets whistled above my head, and for the first time since the beginning of the war I realised that I might be killed. I was still shuffling my feet with inertia when I felt a bullet pierce my back. Sweat was pouring down my face and blood was oozing from my mouth. I couldn't see or think, and I felt that I couldn't stand this mad run any longer. What's the point of running if you know you've already been shot and you're going to die anyway? But my legs carried me towards the forest. When I got there, I collapsed to the ground, as in a semi-conscious state. The panting captain began to shake me by the shoulder. Get up, get up now. I got up, but immediately fell down. The captain himself was hardly breathing and could not help me. I tried to speak, but only coughed, choking on blood. Were you wounded? The captain asked. Yes, I was shot in the back, I whispered, as I felt myself losing consciousness. I woke up because he was shaking me and slapping my cheeks. Wake up. Wake up. You're not going to die. You're all right. We have...
It took him a couple of minutes to convince me that I was alive and well. I wasn't hit. I just couldn't take the maddening exertion and my throat bled. Fortunately, the soldiers did not pursue us into the woods. Having had a little respite, we moved on. Throughout the war, whenever I came under fire, whether on land, at sea, or during enemy air raids, I somehow always thought that if I was killed, it would be by a bullet in the back. We had no idea who managed to escape from the Pixty. Two or three of them ran towards the forest, but did they manage to stay alive? It was too dangerous to shout. We moved cautiously through the forest, listening anxiously for sounds, and ducked into the bushes, even when we heard the flapping of birds' wings. Who knows, maybe she was flying to her chicks, or maybe she had been spooked by humans. By midday, we had travelled about sixteen kilometres from the Pixty in Vinicky. We waded through forests, crossed rivers, crawled through fields, and finally came to a road that could well have been used by the Russians. The sun was high, it became hot, and we decided to make a halt at a small forest stream to wash and wash our uniforms. Having laid out our clothes for drying, we enjoyed stretching out on the grass under the warm sunlight and began to make plans for the near future. Briefly, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Rizard, said the captain. And I'm Stefan, I answered. I apologize for being out of uniform, said the captain with a mocking smile. But you know it's an emergency. It's not for me to explain. I don't know. I want to thank you for helping me deal with that Russian at the barn. I was afraid that he would eventually manage to get to my throat. Rizard was silent for a while, rolled over on his back and, looking up into the blue sky, said, My God, there is nothing better than staying alive. We understood that we would have to walk at least 320 kilometers to Warsaw. We had no food, no money, no weapons, and the Russians had taken away even our watches and cufflinks. We did not know which part of the country was occupied by the Soviets and which by the Germans, and whether there were any Polish armies still fighting the enemy. It was very problematic to walk 320 kilometers through a country occupied by two enemy armies, but at least we were alive, and isn't that the most important thing? The rest of the day we spent in the forest sunbathing and picking berries. Night found us on the road. We travelled in a northerly direction past the bug and the next morning came out near Sapezanka. The town was burning from the grove we could see Soviet tanks rumbling through the streets. Separate gunshots and machine gun bursts were heard. I told Rizard about my childhood memories connected with Sapezanka. Don't you think that the Bolsheviks haven't changed since then? remarked the captain. All day long we slept in the warm sunshine, and our peace was disturbed only by the loud rumbling of our own empty stomachs. In the evening, when it was quite dark, we came to a house in the distance. It was empty and in complete disorder. We quickly removed two pillowcases from the cushions and put a loaf of bread, salt, matches, a knife and cups in each. We also grabbed a couple of plaids. Looking thoughtfully at the bed, I thought how wonderful it would be to sleep in a bed, wouldn't it, Rizard? and wake up the next morning in a pigsty. He sneered. On our way back to the grove, we happened to come across a chicken coop, in which, strangely enough, there were chickens sitting on perches. We grabbed a chicken each, snapped their necks, and put them with the rest of the trophies from the empty house. Now we were ready to stride into the night. After walking a few miles, we came to a ravine, lit a fire, and roasted one chicken on it. I can't say it tasted good. To be honest, it smelled disgusting. We were so hungry that in a hurry we forgot to gut it, and just covered the unplucked chicken with mud from the river and scorched it over the fire. Together with the mud, feathers and skin came off, revealing tender meat, but the meat had a stench. Despite this we nibbled all the bones. Now on a full stomach we were ready for exploits and did not hesitate to go on our way. During the day we slept in the field or in the woods, and walked at night, away from roads and railway tracks, avoiding villages, for fear of meeting Russians or Germans. On the 8th of October, the third day after the escape from Winnicky, we camped in the forest near the town of Tomaszo Yubelski. We ate the remaining chicken, lay down and fell asleep. It is hard to say how long I slept. I was awakened by the hot rays of the sun. It was hot, and without opening my eyes, I rolled into the shade and lay on my back. I raised my hands to put them behind my head and touched something soft, covered in wool. Opening my eyes sharply, I saw above me the horse's belly and legs in stirrups. Bolshevik cavalry, lightning flashed through my mind. But then came a voice addressing me in Polish. 
What are you trying to do, milk my horse? I reluctantly got up and saw a rider in a Polish uniform, looking at me with an evil smile. Next to him, there were four other riders looking at me with undisguised interest. We've been watching you for several minutes now. You are fast asleep, said one of them. We escaped from the Russians, I explained, and we have been travelling from Vinicky for three nights. Rizard continued to sleep soundly, unaware of what was going on around him. Is your companion wounded? No, just dead tired. What's going on? Who are you? I asked in reply. I am a cavalry major, he explained. He and his men, all that's left of the cavalry regiment, which was almost completely destroyed in the battle with the German tanks. They were left with about sixty men. They had set up camp in the forest, and these five were patrolling just the part of the forest where we had decided to rest. Can you explain what's going on now? Is there a war going on? I asked the Major. The war is over. The Germans are in Warsaw, in Krakow, everywhere. The Russians have taken the eastern part of the country. Hmm. So we're all finished. Not us. We keep fighting and we'll fight to the end. Then I saw that Rizard opened his eyes and looked around in bewilderment. He must have thought he was dreaming. When he was sure it was real, he asked, Have you got any food? We've only had one chicken in the last three days. Hey, so you're still lucky. For the last week we've been eating nothing but horse meat, replied the Major. We followed them into the forest camp. Here the usual military discipline reigned. Sentries stood guard and salute was given. We reported to the lieutenant colonel in full uniform. Can you gentlemen ride? was his first question. Yes, Mr. Colonel, Rizard I answered. You'll get horses. You can take them, but you're free to join us or continue on your way. What do you I am at your disposal, Mr. Colonel, replied Rizard. I confirmed Rizard's words. The gentlemen, you may sit down. We were invited to the table. Lunch consisted of a bowl of soup, in which pieces of horse meat, vegetables, potatoes and spices were floating. We ate, enjoying the hot soup and the sunny day. After the meal, the Major led us to the horses. The horses, clean, well-groomed, were tied to trees. What do you feed them with? I asked the Major. That's the usual fodder. The peasants bring it to us at night. I got a nester mare, about a hundred and sixty centimetres high. She had a gauze bandage on the left side of her neck. She had a shallow wound, explained the Major. Nothing serious. The wound doesn't bother her. Be careful with the reins. Her nickname is Witch, but she's a good girl. She's a good rider, too. Attached to Witch's saddle was a long cavalry sabre. I pulled it out of its sheath and weighed it in my hand. Do you know how to use it, Lieutenant? The Major asked. I did but a long time ago, I answered. During military training we had fencing lessons. And riding a horse with a sabre? Um, unfortunately we trained only on stuffed animals. So I have almost no such experience, I admit. Well, you have some experience. You'll need it soon. Be warned, the witch won't like it if you cut off her ears. Rizard and I saddled our horses and followed the Major into the clearing. There the sergeant showed us the basic sword strokes, and we gave the Major a good deal of amusement as we tried to imitate the sergeant's actions. All right, that's enough, he said after half an hour. I realize you'll never be cavalrymen, but you'll be perfectly capable of chopping the heads off Germans. I still couldn't believe what was happening. We were training in a forest clearing as if we were on maneuvers, and this at a time when we had lost a terrible war. The Major's words that soon we would need the ability to use a sabre seemed completely unreal to me. In fact, it was quite real. Patrols travelling around the district brought news, received from the peasants, about the movement of German units. In the middle of the night we all jumped on our horses, split into two groups. We moved through the forest to the road and stopped about 300 metres from it. We dismounted, saddled and fed the horses. Then we had the familiar soup of horse meat and vegetables. I found myself in the group of the Major, who after the meal explained to us the task. Now the colonel and his group should be in a grove on that hill over there, about half a kilometre from the road. The plan is simple. The colonel will send a patrol to watch the road from Tommaso. When the patrol sees a suitable target coming from the town, it will fire a green rocket. After this signal, two of our men will have to fall two telegraph poles so that they block the road. When the Germans are level with that group of trees, he showed with his hand which ones, we will rush to the attack. 
and the colonel's men will cut off their escape routes at that time. In this way they will be trapped, and we can destroy them. It was very much like peacetime maneuvers and seemed very far from reality. He seemed to have read our minds. The Germans will probably have machine guns. We don't. But there's an element of surprise in this business. That's what we're going to use. We have to cross the stubble and get on the road in no time. Speed is everything. Each of you must instantly pick out your prey among the Germans. Retreat will be lost to the trumpet. All meet at the bivouac. The Germans won't chase us in the woods. Any questions? No questions. Then let the horses rest. We'll have enough time to saddle the horses after the green flare. You may smoke. The sun was rising, and when Rizet and I went to saddle the horses, a swarm of flies swarmed over them. Well, Stefan, you have a chance to glory, Rizet said mockingly. Or to be riddled like a scythe by German machine gunners, eh? I answered in his tone. After a little thought, he confessed. Hey, I don't feel like a hero either. I am not a cavalryman. I can even fall off my horse when I jump over a ditch. Yes, if we had a couple of machine guns, then we would have left the Germans in the dust. And how are you going to use the sabre? I asked. I'll hit him on the head, or the neck if the German has a steel helmet. During the whole morning a German motorcyclist and one lorry passed along the road. Not a living soul appeared on the road for several hours. At about one o'clock in the afternoon as we were finishing our soup, the observer shout. A green rocket. Mr. Major, a green rocket. We quickly saddled our horses and jumped into the saddle. The Major rode along the formation, holding the reins in his right hand and chin up with his lift. Mm, tighten the girth, he commanded. Get ready. Now follow me, Steep. He rode towards the edge of the forest. We spread out behind the trees and stood waiting. The excitement of the riders was transmitted to the horses, and they began to shuffle their feet nervously, pulling on their bridles. My witch was restless, arching her neck and beating her hoof. I was also very worried, and I felt sweat trickling down my back. Finally, we saw in the distance a column moving in our direction. A few minutes passed when it became clear that it was a food column of eighteen horse-drawn wagons. The column slowly stretched along the road, and we could see that on each of the wagons sat five to eight German soldiers. At the head of the column rode a motorbike with a machine gun. The same motorbike closed the column. We could already hear the crackle of motorbikes, and we carefully watched the approach of the column to a group of trees, which the Major marked for us as the starting point of the attack. I glanced at my neighbours and saw that they were as worried as I was. The swords at point-blank range. Was the Major's order? The Germans were passing the marked group of trees. Our horses reared up and galloped on the spot, the witch even managed to bite Rizard's horse. After me, commanded the Major and started the horse at a trot. Then, turning round in his saddle, he waited until everyone had ridden out of the forest, rose on his stirrups and shout. Spurring his horse, he raced towards the road, and we followed him. Mm, hurrah, shouted the cavalryman. Mm, ah, my voice joined the general shout. The witch, stretching her neck and pinning her ears, flew across the stubble. Ooh, oh, who? We had already ridden halfway across the field, and the Germans still hadn't opened fire. We saw German soldiers jumping off the wagons and some of them diving into the ditch, and some of them running away along the road. But then a machine gun mounted on a motorbike at the head of the column started to work. The horse in front of me reared up and threw the rider off. A ditch suddenly appeared ahead, separating the field from the road, where wagons stood, horses roared and German soldiers shot back. The witch easily, in one leap, swung over the ditch, skipped between two wagons and ran forward. I hardly managed to turn her round. Something unbelievable was happening on the road. Machine guns were firing, sabres were whistling, shouts and curses in German and Polish were heard. In the midst of this madness, the witch suddenly danced and suddenly ran down the road. I saw a German aiming at me, but then someone cut him down with a sabre. Another German jumped out in front of me, waving his arms. His steel helmet hung behind his back. As I flew up to him, I hit him on the head with my sabre, right on the bald spot in front of me. I cracked his skull, and he collapsed to the ground. The witch went on, and then the German appeared in front of me again. Realising that he would not be able to escape, he swung sharply in our direction and fired. The witch roared and collapsed to the ground. The rider behind me blew the German's head off with a single blow of his sabre. 
staggering and feeling slightly dizzy. I got to my feet and was just about to raise my sabre when the witch threw me into the ditch with a blow of her hoof in the stomach. The lights went out and I lost consciousness. Chapter 7 Several hours must have passed when I awoke to the sound of German speech. A group of soldiers were walking along the road, stopping from time to time near the motionless bodies. Lying in a ditch, I watched them approach. Apparently they had arrived in several trucks accompanied by armoured vehicles. They dragged the damaged wagons and the corpses of the horses aside, and then began to put the dead German soldiers into the lorries. They dumped the bodies of the dead Poles into a ditch. Seeing me lying there with my eyes open, the Germans were at first taken aback. I tried to get up, but nothing came out of it. Not only was my stomach unbearably sore from the witch's hoof, but I had also broken my head in the fall, and the blood was running down my back. One of the soldiers pulled out a pistol, but another stopped him and called for the officer apparently in charge of the operation. We found a wounded Polish pig. Should we finish him off on the spot or take him in for questioning? asked the soldier. Leaning over me, the officer stared intently into my eyes. I couldn't stand up, I was dizzy, but I managed to keep my hands above my head. The officer bent down further, raked me down with one hand and flipped me over onto my stomach. This is where I'm going to have to die, I thought. A bullet will blow my head off in no time. I closed my eyes and instinctively covered my head with my hands. Oh, it's the officer. I heard a voice above me. Do you speak German? A little, I answered. Did you take part in the attack on our column? Yes. When the officer heard my answer, he rolled me over onto my back. You know the war is over, don't you? Yes, I know you were victorious. But you attacked our column. You killed forty German soldiers. Why? he shouted. We, we don't surrender so easily. Stupid romanticism. It's over with now. The Wehrmacht will destroy the resistance, he declared, and turning to the soldiers, ordered me into one of the lorries. He is the only prisoner, and he should be interrogated. It was only now, when I was put into the truck, that I realized why it had taken me so long to regain consciousness and why my head was damaged and bleeding. When the witch had kicked me, I had flown off and hit my head on a large rock at the edge of the ditch. While I was being led to the lorry, I counted eight dead poles in the ditch. Our cavalrymen probably thought I was killed, I decided, and had withdrawn hours ago. Well, we are not so bad. We have lost eight men, but the Germans have lost forty-two. The German column, one armoured car in front and one behind, took the direction to the north and after a long journey we arrived in Zamos. There, instead of taking me straight to interrogation, a polite German doctor from the field hospital bandaged my head and gave me a cup of coffee. I felt much better. Then two soldiers came and chased me to the former army barracks located in the town. The Platz was packed with several hundred Polish prisoners. Some were sitting on the ground, some were walking on the Platz, along the edges of which were German machine gun crews. I was led to the guardhouse and ordered to stay here. After the shift change, the new head of the guardhouse, not finding any orders about me, sent me to the guardhouse. I was glad of this, for I could get some information among my own people. Here is a staging post, one of the captured sergeants explained to me. From here the prisoners are sent by road to Lublin, and from there they say by train to Germany. Hmm, how long have you been in captivity? I asked the sergeant. Today it's exactly two weeks. And how are they treating you? They treat me differently. When they took us prisoner at Biala Podlaska, they lined us up for firing squads. Then some high-ranking German officer came and ordered to feed us. However, two days ago, on the way here, they picked twelve people whose surnames began with the letter and shot them on the roadside. We'll never understand why they do that. What's going on here? I asked. This is my second day here. They give us bread and all the water we want. Well, that's not bad at all. On, them. on the one hand it is, but this morning they shot five men. The head of the guard went round the guardhouse and picked out the victims. He was in charge of the shooting. They shot them right there, against the wall. We all saw it, a gruesome death. I wandered round among the prisoners, looking for familiar faces, but seeing none, I went back to the sergeant. There's talk that we'll be sent out tomorrow morning, said the sergeant. And who is guarding the convoy? So far, two motorbikes with machine guns, one in front, one behind. Soldiers with machine guns on both sides of the column and end. In addition, 
a lorry with soldiers in case someone thinks of making an escape. We did anyone try? Yes, and they were shot immediately. The Germans are bloody clever. They only transport us during the day. It would have been a lot easier in the dark. The situation seemed hopeless. At night we huddled together, we even slept a little. In the morning we were given bread and allowed to fill any containers we had with water. We were then lined up in a column of four in a row, under guard the column. About two hundred metres long, left the training ground, went through the town and came to the road leading northwards to Lublin. It was a difficult crossing. We shaved with difficulty in the heat. Despite the autumn, the sun was scorching mercilessly. Every two hours the column stopped, and, if there was a spring nearby, about ten men under guard fetched water for everyone, and then back on the road again. That day we walked forty kilometres, and before dark, we came to a village. We were given bread and water, and again we spent the night on the formation under heavy guard. In the morning we set out for Lublin, which was about forty-eight kilometres from where we slept. In Lublin we were herded together with hundreds of other prisoners to the central square. We were under heavy guard. Soldiers with machine guns, machine gun crews on lorries, patrols. The prisoners were sent in groups of twenty to the railway station. In the square I sat down next to a sergeant with whom I had talked in Zamotzi. We sat among hundreds of people who were exhausted by the difficult crossing. We did not care how long we had to wait for the train that would take us to Germany. We were thirsty and hungry, dead tired and depressed. We no longer cared about anything. Unbearable thirst was the cause of the events that followed. The sergeant and I were stretched out on a cobblestone square, and suddenly he said, I hear water running. Hmm, so do I, I agreed listening. We looked round and saw the grate of a sewer manhole. Somewhere deep beneath the square, water was flowing. It's just a sewer pipe, I said sadly. Yes, but, he paused, it's pretty big, isn't it? Big enough for what? I didn't understand. I hope you're not going to drink water from the sewer. You don't get it. That's not what I meant at all. I said big enough to fit in. We moved closer to the sewer grate, and, still sitting on the ground, examined it closely. Well, what do you think? The sergeant asked. We can get in, wait until everyone leaves the square, and get out in the dark. Hmm, how deep is it? It doesn't matter. I saw brackets on the walls. I think they go down that shaft to inspect the... Okay, I agree. We asked the people sitting around us to stand up to shield us from the Germans. The sergeant and I lifted the grate. The sergeant went in first, I followed him. The grill was put back in place. We were inside. After a few minutes we heard the Germans running up to the hatch. They looked round, but found nothing suspicious. There were about half a dozen iron bracket steps embedded in the wall leading into the shaft. Putting our feet on the braces, we leaned our backs against the opposite wall of the shaft. In this way the feet of the sergeant, who climbed in first, were just above the sewer drain that ran under the square, while I, being almost under the grating that covered the shaft, could see the sky and the feet of the prisoners in the square. In this suspended state we remained for some time, until it occurred to me that in three days of conversation I had not learnt the name of my companion. <sighs> Listen, I whispered. Yes came a voice from below. My name is Stephen. I'm Vladek, the sergeant replied and added, holding out his soiled hand. Sorry about the dirt. I chuckled quietly. What's so funny? he asked. I just remembered how I had a similar story just a few days ago. Only then, when we introduced ourselves to each other, we were in the nude. You mean you found yourself in a nudist camp in the middle of the war? I had to tell him about escaping from Russian captivity. First we heard overhead the shuffling of the feet of the prisoners, who were gathered in groups of twenty and sent to the station. Then a lorry drove by at speed. An hour later there was the clatter of horse shows, and we realised that a horse-drawn cart was coming. It stopped next to a sewer grate, and a few minutes later a torrent of horse urine rained down on our poor heads. Not only were we soaked to the skin and emitted an unbearable odour, but after a while we began to itch unbearably. All we could do was whisper curses at the innocent animals. Hey, I never realised that a horse's bladder was like a rain cloud, I remarked. Hey, the only damn difference is that rain doesn't stink or irritate the skin, Vladek said. The wagon pulled away, but the light no longer penetrated our hiding place. It was night. We were frozen, unable to relax for a moment. With our backs against the shaft wall and our feet against the metal brackets, 
we could only shift our body weight from one foot to the other. Every muscle, every cell of the body aged from the unbearable tension. After sitting in the dark for about two hours and hearing no sounds from outside, we decided to climb out of the sewer shaft. Ready, I asked Vadek. Ready, he replied. As soon as we get out, we run to the nearest courtyard. Don't delay. We have difficulty. I reached the bars and pressed them with my head and one hand. It wouldn't budge. I pushed harder. It didn't budge an inch. With a great effort, I lifted both hands and pressed against the grating. It absolutely refused to budge. Hey, it was the damn cart. The wheels must have pressed into the grate and jammed it, Vladek said from below. Try it again. I pushed as hard as I could. I tried with all my muscles to move the damn grate, but it wouldn't budge. Now I remembered that it had taken a lot of effort for the two of us to lift it, and now I had to do it alone, after hours in the mine. Che, yes, Stefan, try pushing in the middle. I'll push you from the bottom. Come on. With Vladek's help, I pushed on the grate. No reaction. After a quarter of an hour, I realized I was exhausted and had to take a break. It won't work for Deck. I can't lift her. I'll have to call for help. Hmm. Take your time. Let's give it a try. He took the buckle off his belt and handed it to me. Put it between the bars and the frame and use it as a lever. Maybe it will help. After several unsuccessful attempts, the grate began to give way, and I was able to move it. I did it. It worked, Vadek. Well done. And remember, when you get out, run to the nearest courtyard. I picked up the bars with both hands and put them gently on the ground. The stars were shining in the sky above me. Half a meter up, I stuck my head out and looked around for a few minutes. I can't see or hear anything, I whispered to Vladek. Then get out. Okay, I'm coming out. And there I was, lying on the cobblestone pavement, waiting for Vladek. A minute later he was there. Anything, he whispered. No. Then run over there, Vladek said, pointing to a narrow passage between the houses on the near side of the square. Right now. Yes, come on. I tried to get up and immediately collapsed to the ground. Oh, Vladek, I can't feel my legs. I can't get up. Neither can I. We'd been in the mine too long without moving. Our legs were stiff and wouldn't listen to us. We'll have to crawl, Vedek whispered. It can't be helped. We crawled across the square, expecting that at any moment we might fall into the hands of a German patrol, or that the headlights of a passing lorry would suddenly catch our figures. But we were fortunate. We safely reached the passage between the houses and crawled into the courtyard. For about half an hour we massaged our legs to restore circulation. After that we began to explore the courtyard. The first exceptionally valuable find was a water tap, and we drank a lot of cold water. Now I realize that I am terribly hungry, said Vladek, puffing out his breath. And you're not the only one. We decided to enter the house, thinking that the kitchen window would be the best place for that purpose. So we did. In total darkness, we began to search for food in the cupboard, on the shelves, on the table. My awkward movement caused something to fall from the table with a clatter. Hmm, who's there? A woman's voice sounded from above. We are, I answered. Well, who's we? Hmm, Polish soldiers. We escaped from the Germans. The footsteps came closer, and we heard her enter the kitchen. Hmm, I can't see you, said the woman, but the light mustn't be switched on. The Germans shoot at the windows if they see a light on at night. What do you want? All we could see was her vague silhouette against the wall. From her voice she sounded young. We're very hungry, miss, I said. We'd be very grateful if you'd give us some food. I have something for you. But, for God's sake, get out of here. If they find you in my house, we'll all be shot. She cut a few slices of bread, spread some pork fat on them, and handed them to us with the words, This is all I can give you. The food supply in Lublin is very bad. We were so hungry that before thanking our hostess, we greedily took a big bite of bread each. After that, we asked the woman which road she would advise us to take to get out of the city. Having received the answer, we were about to go to the window, but the landlady stopped us. Why don't you want to use the door? I think it's much easier, she said, turning the key in the door. And cultured, you mean? I replied, certainly. But it doesn't matter now. Good night, ma'am. Good night. Following the instructions we had received, 
We soon found ourselves outside the town without meeting anyone on the way. At dawn we entered the forest and decided to stop there until darkness fell. No, she wasn't very friendly, was she? Veladik said. I don't blame her. What do you want? Two strangers, smelling of horse piss and filth, climbing through the window into her house, demanding food. She's supposed to kiss us for that. No. Do you think she's cute? Maybe she's pretty, maybe she's ugly, I replied. It didn't matter, though. I still liked her voice, Vadek said dreamily. Massa bid I. Let her be our voice in the night. We wanted to sleep, but the itching all over our bodies and the repulsive odour that haunted us prevented us from fulfilling this wish. It was quite dawn. Now we could see the German lorries from afar, so we went in search of some water body or stream to wash and wash our uniforms. We managed to find a pond. We bathed, washed our clothes, hung them out to dry on bushes, lay down in the sun, and... I thought I was still asleep and dreaming. But when I heard giggling, I opened my eyes, sat up and saw the old woman. Leaning on her hoe, she was looking at us, her face lighting up with a smile and then becoming gloomy and thoughtful. Beside her stood two young girls. Hmm, poor children, said the old woman, what the war has done to you. Under the gazes of the giggling girls, I was acutely aware of my nakedness, and our clothes were hung on the bushes. Woken by the extraneous sounds, Vladek opened his eyes and darted into the bushes. To loud laughter, I followed him. Are you hungry? the old woman asked, laughing. Yes. We answered in unison from the bushes. You can't come to us, the Germans might find us. But when it gets dark, I'll send you something to eat. Will you wait? Yes, yes, of course. Thank you very much. She shook her head thoughtfully and gripped the handle of the hoe even tighter with her weary palms. Now, can war do any good? No, it's only evil. Only evil. I'm an old woman now. I've been through three wars. War is bad for men and cattle alike. But this is the worst. The flying monsters and all that? Miss Lyon suddenly, as if she'd forgotten what she'd just said. She ordered. Put your trousers on. You're like newborn babies. While you're packing, I'll send you some food. Oh, and be careful in the bushes. They're thorny. You'll hurt yourselves. At these words, the girls jumped again, but the old woman shouted at them, and soon the women were walking down the road with hose on their shoulders. As soon as they had gone, we dressed quickly and sat down in the shade. The girls came in when it was quite dark. They brought clay pots with hot chowder and a jug of steaming milk. After we had eaten, we followed them to the farm and spent the night in the barn. I slept soundly, but I thought I heard Vadik fidgeting and the door creaking. That seems to have been the case, for when I was ready to move out the next morning, he did not show much enthusiasm. And I, I don't think I shall go with you, Stephen, he said. I have nothing to do in Warsaw. I have no one there. I'd rather stay here. The girls won't mind, surely. Hey, I can help on the farm. At least I'll always be fed. That's for sure, I sneered. I left my uniform at the farm and wore peasant clothes instead. I could mingle with the crowds of refugees on the roads and I could walk long distances in a day. In this new guise, however, it was more difficult for me to gain the confidence of the peasants. They were suspicious of me, instantly recognising me as a rogue. I had to steal food and once, terribly hungry, I even went to a German field kitchen and addressed the cook, who was stirring boiling soup in a huge cauldron. I am very hungry, I said in German. Without saying a word, the cook scooped up the soup with a ladle and looked at me questioningly. I had nothing but an old hat. I took it off and the cook poured the soup into it. I felt no shame. I was hungry and I had to reach Warsaw. I wanted to live. 